So I think I'm the last speaker of this afternoon, so bear with me, it's almost done. I think you must be tired after a full day, but we're almost there. So let me start with explaining to you the, the title, or at least pointing your attention to this. Because actually the title of this presentation uh, was a bit of a surprise to me. So how RNG's new products are scaling rapidly through a focus on benchmarking against big tech instead of traditional industry players. I will come back to that a bit later, but keep it somewhere in your mind. So what's RNG? RNG is a bank. It's a global bank. We're based out of the Netherlands. I'm based in Amsterdam. Um, we have a big revenue number here, but revenue is not really a very good metric for a bank. Uh, but it's up here. We have uh, 55,000 uh, people. Uh, and I'm the head of innovation for wholesale banking. So I deal with large corporate clients, uh, not retail, not consumers, but the big corporates. Uh, and I have um, the mandate to innovate for the firm, to have the blockchain team and the artificial intelligence team. So this is me. You've seen me on stage, so that's better, I think. One thing to point out here is a bit important a bit later in the presentation. I've been with ING for over 25 years, and I am what you would call a traditional banker. So I've been in relationship management for clients. I've done plenty of lending in each and every asset class. Uh, and those kind of uh, jobs. So, accomplishments. Actually, this is one of us, one of our um, accomplishments that we're really proud of. It's called Cobase. It's a spin out of ING. ING is still a majority shareholder. And what it does, it is an aggregator of bank accounts for corporates. So, like I said, I'm from Amsterdam, we're a Dutch bank. Um, the, the sort of market size in the EU is similar to the population in the US. The only problem is we have 27 countries and they have their own laws and regulations. So most of our corporate clients, they have banks in every country. So what happens is this poor treasurer, he travels from one location to another. He has, um, from each and every bank account, he has a token with him to do payments. So he has a full suitcase of tokens. Uh, and he has no way to actually see what his overall liquidity position is. So Cobas is helping that. Cobas is aggregating this all, so he has a full view on liquidity. Uh, but also you can um, initiate payments on each and every bank account from just one device. So very interesting uh, thing. And we were super proud that Cobas was actually uh, put on the CB Insights FinTech 250 list. So that's, I think, nice recognition. So let me get back to the question. So the question was, why are we so quick in scaling? Um, because we benchmark against big tech rather than to industry competitors. So what I said is this was a bit of a surprising title to me. And why was this a surprising title to me? So when, when we pre-discussed this uh, conversation with uh, CB Insights, um, I said, well, you know, we are now on average having uh, our initiatives to scaling, which is a working product with a paying customer in 15 to 18 months, but this is way too slow, we have to go much faster. And the response was, what do you mean way too slow? Well, the, most banks we speak to, um, they are still in PowerPoint phase after 12 months. And I was a bit startled by that remark because I, I all of a sudden started to realize that we don't see other banks as our competitors at all anymore. It hadn't even crossed my mind to think about that uh, other banks would be the benchmark, I should say this off against. So why are we seeing big tech as our competitors? Simply because they are. So if you look at um, the US, you have obviously Amazon Pay, Amazon starting to be in lending, they're lending to, to merchants, you have Google Pay, you have Apple Pay, and in Europe we also look at the east side of the world um, where you see Ant Financial uh, coming into our market. And let me give you a little bit of an example there, which, which illustrates how big this trend actually is. Um, so Ant Financial is obviously huge in China, which is easy when you have so many people in China, but still they're huge in China. And they have payments in, in a totally new, disruptive way with QR codes, people can scan and it's automatically paid. But now they are following Chinese tourists into Europe. So they are working to get merchants in Europe accept this QR code system. And when we really started to realize what was happening is when we learned that a very small taxi company in a very small village in the Netherlands called Meppel, not even the Dutch know where Meppel is, 
It is something probably of the size of Spencer in Iowa, if you know where that is. Um, so really, really small, this company accepted Ant Financial QR code. Then it starts to be scary, because once they start to do that, they can easily ask for the same from us. And we actually see that in payments, double-digit percentages are eaten away from our uh, business every year, especially by big tech, and some by fintech, but especially by big tech. So that's why we say, if we want to compete in this world, we have to be as good as big tech, we have to be as fast as them, and we have to really make sure that we can get user flows and get uh, um, really to the core of the product as soon as they can. So that is why the title is what it is, and it's what we try to do. The other secret of success is we're not afraid to spin it out. So we are a regulated industry, um, and actually a banking license slows uh, fintechs down. So a lot of fintechs, they need a bit of regulation, they need a bit of license, but not the very, very heavy banking license. So sometimes we just spin it out to make sure that they can speed up and not being hampered by our banking license. But also because simply they can be faster without us or they're not so strategic to us. Other ones is, this is a bit of a, an interesting one, consider leadership with traditional experience. I think I'm the example of this. So when you appoint a head of innovation, you can basically do two things. You can get somebody from outside your firm to really speak ab about innovation and get it going, or you can have somebody who knows the company inside out and build all the bridges with the standing organization. That's why. Um, missteps, we made a lot. I think one thing that has slowed in a lot of our initiatives down tremendously is that we didn't start with the right team. So very often we started with somebody who had the idea and said, well, you know, I'm willing to spend two days a week on it. And we said, oh yeah, already get started. And every month he was burning money and nothing really happened. And the other misstep we made is to go for initiatives that were boiling the ocean rather than f focusing on one little thing. So where do we want to go? Um, I think what we have to get better at is killing initiatives way earlier on. So now we are still thinking, well, you know, this nice person is so passionate about it, so let him continue for another two months. So we have to get better. Like I said at the start, we want to roll out new products in six to nine months, which is quite a leap from where we are today. Um, and what is really a challenge to us, what we want to get better in, is in the end, the things that we think are really strategic to ING, to get them back into the firm. Um, so to integrate them with the sending organization and then you have to get on the backlog and you have to invest the money and there has to be budget and there's a zillion people who think I haven't uh, been involved in this, not invented here is a big thing. So this is something we have to become way better at. I think that's it. Very nice presentation, uh, and, and very many interesting aspects related to the previous conversations. Um, let me start actually from the end. And, and you said you had this concept of a lab, and distancing that lab from the organization. Yeah. And I think it's eerily similar to what Giovanni said a few minutes ago on not going for extreme trans transparency. Can you talk a little bit about that? Where, where, like, if you can give us an example where you saw there was a need to separate that, and when do you bring that back to the organization, that lab that you're building? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure we've completely figured it out, but um, we, we have three labs, or I have three labs for wholesale banking in Singapore, in London, and in Amsterdam, and we're looking at opening one in New York, actually. Um, but we put them a little bit aside because it makes them grow faster. So again, because we're a regulated industry and I think there was a poll in one of the earlier sessions, a lot of people, a lot of companies struggle with public cloud. So we have a private cloud as the bank because we have to keep our data safe. Um, but we allow the initiatives to be on the public cloud because it's, it speeds them up tremendously. But that means that they have to be a bit aside of the bank. Yes. So they cannot be in the same infrastructure, IT infrastructure. They cannot have access to the same data. So that's part of the reason why we put them separate and simply to make sure that they don't get um, all the policies of, of the regulated bank immediately uh, on their table. Um, they don't get into the processes of everybody who wants to be involved and a stakeholder before a decision is made. So that's why we put them at a little bit of a distance. And when you integrate them, how is that process going? Well, it's, I think it's something we really still struggle with um, because we, we basically when they sort of get to scaling, 
um, we have to make a choice. Do we integrate them? Do we sell them off and we keep a majority? Or do we sell them off to a minority or completely? And um, if, we, if we decide to integrate them, um, actually that's the moment where it starts to be really hard. Because then what I call the immune system of the bank is coming in with full force. So there's people saying, I, I wasn't involved, I didn't know this, I don't have budget, etc., etc. Where we have been really successful is when we have engaged everybody very early on. This is coming, we need your commitment. Um, and they have been involved in the decision making mm -hmm. of shall we continue with this project. That's actually the best way to do it. So can you talk actually exactly about that process of scaling? Um, I think Cobase maybe can be a good uh, case study for that. In, in your mind, what, what are the steps, once you get approval now to do exactly that, what allow you to scale it so fast? What are the main challenges you feel? But, but really, what are the things that by now other organizations can learn in trying to scale that fast? Well, I think we learned that scaling is really hard. It's really difficult. So actually building the initiatives up to that phase is relatively easy. Uh -huh. um, so then you go to scaling and they have a product that they bring to the market to more than their four pilot clients or whatever they were then the IT has to be stable. It has to be up 24 seven. And then all of a sudden the policy house uh, of ING may not be that bad. And there may have been reasons why we ask for certain things. Um, then they have to go out and find a lot of clients. That's a little bit easier because obviously the clients are ING clients. So we created a whole process for all our salespeople to actually integrate Cobase into their uh, sales pitch. Um, so that was an easier part. And I think that is why it's interesting also for fintechs to cooperate with the bank because we have the client base. So the client part is a bit easier when you have the base already, um, but especially really getting it into a solid product that also we want to put our brand behind uh -huh. um, is hard. So you, you mentioned we, we get into the scaling discussion through your point about the fact that you scale much faster than your industry. But I'm sure that each one of these projects has of an aspect of comparing to the tech area where it's about speed, but you have many other aspects of or metrics that are more peer related. How do you compare, what, what are the metrics that are more peer related uh, when, you, when you look at the success of these projects or, or these proof of concepts? Well, I know I'm, I, I'm not even sure we look that much at our peers. I think where it comes in is um, that in a couple of areas where we are innovating, we are certainly not alone. So we do a lot of around trade on the blockchain, mm -hmm. um, or certainly not alone, A, because on the blockchain you need other people to work with. So we work with consortia and there's a lot of initiatives. So their time to market is super important because if you're not the first and you're not able to, to, to grab a part of the pie, um, probably somebody else will be the winner. Um, so that is why we sometimes look a little bit at those kind of initiatives. What is happening there? How far are they? Are we going fast enough? Mm -hmm. uh, but we really don't look that much at, at our peer group. Interesting. Now, actually talking about that a little bit, um, if I compare you to the two previous uh, talks here, that in, in many ways have the similar role, but have a very different approach to their, to their proof of concept. Right? They try to integrate within the firm, try to see how they make impact on their hedging strategies, their bottom line. You mentioned you, you spin off most of them. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about what, because I'm sure there is some debate internally on, on one side, keeping control of the entire value chain, and that's something that banks usually like to do, yeah, compared I, to this notion of spinning it off. I think, I think part of the reason why we do this differently is, um, and it has been said before as well, eh, well um, many people believe, and we do as well, that the world will turn to platform business models. Mm -hmm. And a platform business model, if you take WeChat or Alibaba or Amazon as an example, they are not doing everything themselves. So they work a lot with other people who they don't own. They may have a share in, but very often not even. They just have an agreement. And we think this is where the world is moving, also for banking. Um, so we are preparing ourselves as well to work with partners that are a little bit further away from us. Um, we think that in the end, we have to be a platform where people can do all their financial services. And it doesn't really matter whether it's an ING product or another bank's product if it is the best solution for a client. So if that is really your philosophy, um, it's relatively easy to spin stuff out because you will w work with external parties a lot anyway. So what's the type of relationship are you keeping with these organizations? You mentioned that some of them you invest, some of them you, are, you own a minority, a majority. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, we, we are getting a little bit better in making those decisions. So, so we've now selected a couple of areas which are, we think ING has a right to play. Um, and there, I think we will be a little bit more careful in spinning them out completely. So for instance, for wholesale, we've said one of our big spaces is, is trade. Um, we are the largest bank in trade and commodity finance. We're very big in shipping. We're very big in metals and mining. So it's a space we know really, really well, and a lot of disruption is taking place there. So in that space, we think, you know, we are looking at, do we have an opportunity here to create a platform or to be instrumental in driving a platform to happening? Um, and it's certainly not easy to be the orchestrator of the platform. We, mm -hmm. we hope that will be the outcome, but we don't know for sure. But it makes that we made a sort of decision tree. So for everything we are seeing for, for trade techs or uh, all kind of people who approach us, but also for our own uh, initiatives to basically look at how strategic is it. And there's a whole decision tree. Does it bring us towards a platform? And then what is the best way to actually work with that? So more and more we start to, to base our thinking around strategic themes, that this is important to us. So if it's really important to us, we will think twice before we completely spin it out. And there's stuff where we simply say, you know, it's a great initiative, and brings a lot of value to the market, but it's so far away from where RNG wants to be. You know, let's find other investors. And then you just let it go? You don't retain any relationship with that? Well, we can, you know, so far, I think we will be looking at a minority share. Uh -huh. Um, but also there it depends a little bit, will it still be regulated by our banking license? Even with a minority share, regulators can be quite um, tough on those kind of things. They say it's still your reputation that's on the line. So that's stuff we take into consideration as well. Yeah, you mentioned again, I want to go back to the point of platform and ask the same question that I asked Giovanni, which is everybody wants to be a platform now. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned WeChat, we mentioned Amazon before, uh, Alibaba, everybody wants to be. But there are key challenges, and, and, and there are challenges in, in execution, there are challenges in, in a, if, having a different set of metrics to measure success and, and to measure, a, because you're, you're taking a smaller part of the pie of all. You have to, to leave the part, a fairly big pie part of the pie to your collaborators. Can you talk a little bit about that? What, how do you think that changed the way you look at innovation? Well, we, I th we think that, that um, in platforms, uh, but also in the current business, um, we see that in our current business, that when you're the infrastructure, actually that is a bad place to be. Because prices that people are willing to pay for infrastructure are trending to zero. So as a bank, you see that that is happening in payments. We are the infrastructure. Uh, and the, the, the fees that people are paying for payments has, have gone down so tremendously. So this is a scary part to be in. So we think that the real, the real thing you have to do is uh, make sure that you add value to clients, value that they are willing to pay for. And you can only do that in our view if you're solving a problem that is so big that they really uh, want to leave something for it or pay for it or something like that. So that's the first thing we look for. And then if you go to platforms, it's, it's far from certain that a bank can be the leader of a platform. Um, so uh, I think one of the, we, we look a lot at WeChat, for instance, and that's more on the consumer side, but what they did really, really well is start in the lifestyle of people, and then the rest will follow. So if you start in the infrastructure from people, infrastructure is always a nuisance. Um, so for us, especially as a bank, who wants to do their finances in the weekend? You know, you, you have way better stuff to do. So you have to, you have to start thinking about, is, is the fact that I have an app with which people can do their payments, is that really the value? Or is there a different value that really will, will make people go to you? So that's where we are still looking at. We also realize that as a bank, we are very far away from the primary process. Mm -hmm. So it's not so easy to be in the core of a platform. But there are a couple of things we think we're very good at, which can be of value to any platform owned by anybody. And that's also things that we are developing more and more. So to bring value to a platform and maybe from that spread out ourselves and become a platform or, or orchestrate a platform. Uh -huh. Interesting. Um, going a little bit on, on the same, going back to the point of, of a spinning off, the opposite of spinning off is, is killing a project, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, and, and then you mentioned that you would like to be better at that. Can you talk a little bit about what metrics you're using to make the decision? Maybe even start with an example of something that you haven't killed fast enough or you killed too quickly and, and maybe in retrospect you shouldn't have? 
Um, yeah, so I think we have a we have a quite a structured process around innovation, um, which we designed ourselves. But it's it's based on lean startup and agile and and design thinking. So we have stage gates, and if every stage gates, we really look at. Um, we start with problem fit, and we really look at is this a problem worth solving? Um, and so aren't we boiling the ocean? But is there a good starting point of a problem? And then we go to solution fit. And we see, is there a solution already out there? A fintech already doing that? Or is it something we have to build ourselves? Um, so I think problem fit, when we think a team has, a, has really hit on something and they have validation, we validate already in that phase with clients to see whether it's really big enough. Then we very often let them go through, which is fine. Um, in solution fit, I think we have to be a little bit more critical. So. Um, that is, before you go to market fit, so you test is there a market big enough and are the clients willing to pay for it, you can already see the first things. And actually you very often can see it at the beginning. We see a lot of our teams and you sense from day one they're in love with the solution, but they should be in love with the problem. And what we too often do is that, let, that we let them continue because we think that there really is a problem. Um, but if you have people already there who have the solution in their back of their mind, the chances that they will really work on a problem that's big enough and will find the right solution to that problem and maybe pivot from what they had in the back of their mind from the start is really difficult for a team. So, so actually that is a part where we already can see this is not going to work. And sometimes actually killing, killing it is not the best thing. So one of the bigger um, examples that, that we're having is we had a team working on KYC, and KYC is, I think, the biggest problem for banks, and it's the biggest problem for our clients. And they were really onto something, but they were they were using they were they were um, approaching it in a way where they were asking for way too much money way too early on, which is a red flag as well, because they were starting to build something huge, solving every aspect, and we know that that doesn't work. You have to start small, minimum viable product, build on that, first get a client base and then build it out. But there we said, you know, I personally went to clients to, to go uh, accompany the team on the validation sessions and the clients were so happy with it. They were so passionate about what we're doing. I said, I'm not going to kill this project because we're, they're really onto something, but I have to change the team. So I basically completely changed the team um, had a new team in, and it took them a couple of months to get on track with everything, but now they're going so super fast. So it's really the combination, mm -hmm. having the right problem and the right team. And if one of the two doesn't feel right, change it or stop it. So can you talk maybe a little bit about the beginning of the funnel? Because we're talking a lot about the funnel itself. Um, how are these team formed? Is it like organic? Is it that the case that different within a group, they allocate that to a specific group of people? How is like you, you had the wrong team on the right problem? How did that happen? Um, well, yeah, well, you know, we weren't so focused at first on teams. So at first, we knew team was important, but somebody had an idea and was passionate, and we said, you know, why don't you start working on it? Um, and then slowly, we we found people to accompany this person. Um, and actually, we found out this is not the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a team from the start that has the right people and, and really committed to it, you lose a lot of time. The energy sips out of the people who have already started it because they don't have the right people. They don't go fast enough. Um, so we now are in our, new, um, in our new labs in London and Singapore. We start completely differently. We start with a cohort of people. So um, say nine or 10, 12 people. Um, we let them in a couple of weeks form teams where they have the right chemistry together and the right sort of expertise. So a little bit of the initiative lead, the company CEO to be, and a techie very often. Um, and then once they form teams, then we, they, we let them explore and, and look for a problem. Um, you know, the jury's still out. I, they're not that far yet, but already you can see that the, the, the quality of the ideas that we're getting to the table is way higher than what we had and what, much more validated already, much more concrete. So we hope that's a better way of approaching it. Yeah, and, and throughout the way, do you see the same people come back to with ideas again, or usually if they're very successful, they're going to be spun yeah, up? Yeah, if they're very successful, they, like, they're, they're like, going with the initiative. Um, I think in general, yes, you see the same people also from inside the organization coming back with the ideas. 
it, it is a certain mindset of people that you need. So very often, and it's one of the reasons why we, why we had the wrong team on the right problem, is we very often work with external people, so not ING people, to bring an ID forward. And um, we have a subject matter expert in a team who is an ING person, because mm. obviously we know a lot about it. But the entrepreneur who has to make this big is very rarely an ING person. And wh why is that? Um, we're a bank. So um, from the day you enter a bank, you are drilled on spotting risk, mitigating risk, and working with risk. Well, if you want an entrepreneur, it's somebody who has to spot opportunities, work with opportunities, go for opportunities, and take risk. So it's a mindset that is not very common in, in mm -hmm. bankers. So that's why we very often work with external people. Um, and they can have such different views of how to do this than we have that that doesn't match. So I'll, again, running out of time. So I'll ask you the final question that I asked the, uh, my previous colleagues. Um, a firm that has that culture or, or has the ability to, from the drive innovation that is a model for you. And again, not Amazon. <laughs> that's oh, and I, actually, I think we look a little bit more east. So I think uh, WeChat and Alibaba are mm -hmm. really huge examples for us. Um, I think, you know, it's amazing what they are doing. The Ant Financial, for instance, is replacing its core systems every four to five years. Yeah. Um, we have worked with our core banking system for 30 years. That was complete obsolete legacy. And we are one of the very first banks who have actually changed it to a new core banking system. So if you start to think to your business from that perspective, that you have to change it every four to five years to be at the cutting edge of technology, so you can actually be so fast, and come up with all the new initiatives. Um, that is really so amazing that that is what we're looking at. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, WeChat. WeChat is an excellent example for also where the founders realize that by now they are too old and too much from the old regime to, uh, to innovate. So Pony Ma is actually probably looking exactly. for the next generation exactly. already. Exactly. That's actually an ex yeah. excellent model for that. Yeah. Henry, thanks so much. I would love to thank also all the other speakers. Thanks everybody for coming for our final session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.